And I have always Merry and Bright. I haven't read that. Have you read that? I've been reading some of it. I just got that not too long ago. Eddie Pepitone, welcome to the Rhodes Library. Hey, thank you, Tom. Uh, wow, I am blown away just from the tour. If folks who are listening try to get a tour of Tom's apartment, it is outrageously cool. And uh, I'm very excited to talk about our man, Henry Millers. We have been talking about doing this podcast for a year. <laughs> Has it been a year? Yeah. But we're going to wow. get together and we're going to do a... Originally, you and I were going to both read The Rosie Crucifixion. Oh. And we were going to do... Which is the three books. The Plexus, trilogy, Sexus, Nexus. N- Nexus, Plexus, and Le- uh, Sexus. Se- Lo- Lexus is the book about cars. <laughs> he never wrote that. The Lexus. Nexus, Plexus, and Sexus. Yes, and uh, I've read them. I I always go back to them. Miller's one of these authors. You could just go, you know what? I don't feel good today, which for me is a lot of days. And I go back and I read him. And, you know, it's just awesome to read Miller because he's a guy who smiled in the... F- He's the guy who smiled in the face of struggle. Yeah. And he's a Brooklyn boy. I'm a Brooklyn boy. I, you know, and I wanted to, you know, my first question to you was, you know, as a New Yorker, how much does he mean to you? He means a hell of a lot to me because, you know, he was growing up in New York. What was it? Was it the 30s, 40s? He was uh, actually growing- the, the, the teens and the 20s. And I'm, I'm going to give a, a little timeline Oh, please do, because of, of I'm it, terrible of, with dates. And I'm going I'm to give a timeline of his life because, uh, you know, he, 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 he gave up his whole life and threw his life into creation and being Absolutely. a writer and following his dream. And he was really, really poverty stricken. He used to hit people up for money all the time, for money, for meals, and he... He embraced, I mean, I don't know if embrace is the right word, but he knew, and this is what I love about Miller, is that he knew that the artist's path was the only path for him. He he knew that, and, and he talked about, and this is why I loved him as a New Yorker, he talked about just the senseless, the senselessness of capitalism and consumerism Back in the, in the 19- 30s, in, in, yeah. in, the, in the 40s. And, and now it's so insane. It's yeah. so insane. But um, Miller was the, talking about it back then. I'm, I'm a Henry Miller freak. The Rosie Crucifixion, Nexus, mm. Plexus, and Sexus is, is one of my favorites. And, and I, I, I can't stop buying old editions of them when I come across them. Yeah, these are cool. Uh, in, in, in bookstores. And, you know, you said you keep going back to that. I go back to it. I want to reread it again. It's been probably 10 years. Yeah, and I and I think Henry Miller has something to do with my fascination with Paris because yeah. So so he, his father was a tailor. He's born in Brooklyn, and he's got a job at the telephone company. He's got a great job, and he's married. Telegraph company, I think. He was changes it? it to Telegraph. Oh, okay. In Cosmodynamic the, tele. He, he called it Cosmodynamic in the book. But it's basically, I think he was working for like the Bell Telephone Company. Yeah, but he had a great yeah. job. He's married, and he's unhappy. Yep, he's unhappy. He wants to be marriage. a writer, and then he he's going to these dance halls where like you can like you can for ten cents you can dance with a girl. And he meets June. He meets June, and June's a bisexual. Ah, yeah, yeah. And so they, she's got a friend that she's uh, a female lover. They take was that a- Mona, or was Mona another name for his, you know, incredible passion? You remember Mona? Um. It, it, it was, it, I think Mona was involved with uh, the the, cruci- the Rosie Crucifixion as well, but I, it could be another book. But um, yeah, June, it's amazing. The, the Rosie Crucifixion is kind of, it's kind of like the story of being crucified on the cross of love, on the cross of love. Miller, I think, was talking about how when you completely head over heels love somebody, there's going to be a lot of bloodletting, like on a crucifixion. Wow. I, I and, and, and that's why I love spending time with Eddie Pepitone. <laughs> because, like, I've read these books twice. Uh-huh. And, like, that, uh, that synopsis... 
Oh, really? I, 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 I didn't look at it that way. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, for me... I thought he was just being cheeky. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he talks about his all-consuming love for June and how... And then they made that movie, Harry, uh, Henry and June... Yeah, which was with, about their, their their they had a really heated sex life. Okay, continue. I'm sorry. Yeah, I now Henry and June. Now, do you know that Anais Nin was involved? Anis Nin, yeah. Anis, and how I've do got, you say it? Anis Nin. Anis Nin. I always called her Anais. I've, Anis Nin. I've got, I've got um, some of her books too. She yeah. was paid by some wealthy guy to write erotica, like a penny a word to write. Erotica. A dollar a page, something like that, to write erotica. Yes. And she yes. was married. He had a, a long artistic and love and sex relationship with her. They were great collaborators. She helped him get his first book published. But so for the timeline of Henry Miller's life, right. so he starts hanging out with June. Her and uh, her lover took a trip to Paris in 1928 and he went over there. With them? With them. Was that uh, his first time in Paris? That was his first time in Paris. So he wants to move to Paris. And start this new life and be a writer and experience life. Well, he also... So he comes back to New York and the stock market crashes uh, in 1929. But he's already, got, he's already got his ticket, his plan. So like a month after the stock market crashes, he moves to Paris and he's there for like 10 of the happiest years of his life until like 1939 when the Nazis invade. And right before the Nazis invade... He leaves and he goes to Greece. He lives in Greece for two years. That's when he writes Colossus of Marusi. Right. And then, I think it was 1941, 1942, he moves to Big Sur. Yes. In, Cal in Northern California. And that's they have a Henry Miller Library there. Yeah. Have uh, you been? I've been three times. I was there last month. I've been there a couple of times. Oh, really? You were there last month? In December, I drove up there with How my is mom. it these days? I haven't been there in a while. It's a great. I mean, it should be more um, like the Steinbeck Museum. Uh, in Salinas. I've never been. Each section mm -hmm. is one of his books. So, like, you enter his book. Oh, so, I mean, this awesome. is like kind of, you know, hippies run this thing. and They do, the Henry don't Miller they? thing. And it's like, they've got yeah. some books for sale. Yeah. Some and, watercolors, some paintings by him as well. And it's a little, a nice, you know, little redwood grove. Yeah. Which is lovely to go visit. But um, uh, I, 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 I wish it was more... You know, uh, like b honoring each book. So here, let me read this. Um, yeah. uh, oh, and then and then he lives a after uh, however long he was in Big Sur. He moved to the Pacific Palisades yes. in L.A. Yes. And there's the famous photo of him playing ping pong with a naked woman. Yes, he was uh, and, and quite the ladies' man, uh, Miller. Right up until and he was and he was bald, which is the biggest reason I have hope. You know, that's why you love Miller. I, I, sexy bald guy. Sexy bald but guy. But that just shows you like the the brain is sexy. Absolutely, you know. I mean, I'm I'm besieged with women because of <laughs> I don't know why you're laughing, but you know, I'm besieged with women because of my um brain, stage charisma and the fact that I always have cashews on me. <laughs> Chicks dig cashews. Chicks love, cashews are the cocaine of the nut world. <laughs> That's what I always say. You know, you <laughs> That's what I always say, you baby. Can't, you can't stop once you get started. Okay, so let me read you this from, mm. from Wikipedia. Henry Valentine Miller, born on December 26th, 1891, 1891, died on June 7th, 1980. And he was a Capricorn, and he felt very, and, I, and I'm a Capricorn. What, like, what he would end Cap his, I mean, what month is Capricorn? Uh, it's December 22nd to... January 21st. Oh, got you. Okay. So um, he would end his letters to very good friends, your Capricorn friend. Mm. And that's why there's a book called Your Capricorn Friend. Never read that one, yeah. Um, have, I have you read that? I have not read that one either. Is that a book of his letters? I think it is. Yeah. Uh, Henry Valentine Miller was an American writer. He was known for breaking with existing literary forms and mm. developing a new type of semi-autobiographical novel that blended character study, social criticism, philosophical reflection, stream of consciousness, explicit language, sex, surrealist, free association, and mysticism. Yeah. His most characteristic works of this kind are Tropic of Cancer, Black Spring, 
Tropic of Capricorn, and the Rosie Crucifixion Trilogy, which are based on his experiences in New York and Paris, Mm. all of which were banned in the United States until 1961. He also wrote travel memoirs and literary criticism and painted watercolors. Yeah, yeah, he he was a big watercolorist, yeah. Um, He... uh, He was a big influence on... Kerouac loved Henry Miller. And you know what? I I read a thing recently on uh, George Orwell in his George Orwell's book of essays. He's saying that there's not any good writers left at this moment except for one guy. Was it Miller? And it's Henry Miller. That's awesome. George Orwell points out. When did Orwell write that? Around? Do you remember? Oh, shit. I want it, yeah, but I, Miller died. You said when did he die again? June seventh, nineteen eighty. He made it to nineteen eighty. Yeah, wow, that was the year Lennon got shot. John Lennon. That was a tough year for creative people. For me, because I love John Lennon. Because uh, Lennon, John Lennon, uh, was kind of the Henry Miller of the Beatles. I think Lennon was the most scathing. Um, of the Beatles, but like, Henry wasn't. I mean, he, he yeah, he, he could be critical, but I mean, his, his he was really joy and optimism and um, yeah, yeah. I agree with that, but I'm such I'm like kind of um, I guess I guess I'm an optimist at heart because you know when people see me do comedy or or read some of the shit I write. Um, they go, wow, what a what a dystopian, pessimistic fellow Eddie Pepitone is. But I think I'm just kind of honestly dealing with what I feel. And I, I mean, the fact that I'm fucking putting out art like Miller. I mean, I'm not <laughs> comparing myself to Miller, but the fact that I'm putting out art. But you're being creative. Yeah. You're, you're writing jokes. You're writing yeah. different pieces. I mean, that's an act of creativity. Yeah, and it's an act. And I of, agree. I mean, there is in your, you know, black uh, pessimism. It, it, it's full of bright optimism. You think Miller was like that because he got he got very dark, didn't he? Yes, at yeah. times. At times. But I mean, like in his lowest moments, he finds the the, the joy in life. Yeah, and um, he was a big exercise freak. Did you know that? No. Yeah. I was reading. Uh, I forget which book or no, or reading an author on Miller, but. He had a real discipline with exercise, and I'm, I forget where it came from. I don't think it was military, because I don't think Miller would be No, caught, he was never in the military. Caught dead in the military, but he was just uh, a guy who fucking exercised all, you know, like every morning or whatever, Miller did that, and he was in great shape to the end, you know? I bring that up because I just think that helped his state of mind, and... Um, Longevity, you know. Oh, you know, uh, one thing you you were saying about when he lived in Paris, where he had this brilliant system of all these different friends that would feed him every night of the week. So he's completely broke. He's being a writer, but like it would be like Monday he would have dinner at this family's house, and Tuesday he'd have this friend's house. Yeah. So every night of the week, yeah, he had a different house to go to for dinner. It was a Perfect, flawless system. And they were artists. They were painters. I think uh, writers. Lawrence Durrell was one of those guys. Uh, not a very well-known writer, Durrell. Um, I forget some of the other names, but just guys. I, I, I guess they loved having Miller around yeah. because of that <clears throat> optimism. Well, he's such know. an intelligent guy, and then also they wanted to to, to support him artistically, in, right? Like in, without giving him money. Yeah. To support him. Yeah. Yeah. I remember reading his experiences about Paris because I've never been to Paris, dude. I still You're haven't. You're cheating yourself. <laughs> Do you love it? Paris is my favorite city in the world. It is. Yeah. Tell me why. Because I'm sure it, it relates to Miller, you know. It has a lot to do with Miller. and <clears throat> But the first love of my adult life was with a woman from Paris. Oh, is that right? Natalie. We're still very good friends. Was she your June? Uh, no. Okay. Um, we lived together in San Francisco for seven years. And so she turned me on to, you know, my first trip to Paris. I, I didn't get into Henry Miller until I was living in San Francisco and going into City Lights books 
going into Green Apple Books. Love City Lights. I don't know Green Apple. That's on Clement. Okay. Um, I forget where I first, you know, came across it. But once I read my first Henry Miller book, I, I just, you know, it's like when you love a band, it's like I want to buy everything they ever put out. That's great. Because I kind of feel like, you know, among comedians, I don't hear anybody talking about Henry Miller. You know, and Eliza Schlesinger's latest special, no mention of Miller. Um <laughs> 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 That's hilarious. I have no money, no resources, no hopes. Mm. I am the happiest man alive. <laughs> That's the beginning of I forget which book. That's, yeah, that, that's, I, that uh, might be. Tro- that's one of the tropics. That's one of the tropics. Cancer, probably. That might be a cancer. Probably six is the great. I call Henry Middle. The, here, here's a forward. From Tropic of Cancer. Can I read it? Yes. For a second. I call Henry Miller the greatest living author because I think he is. I do not call him a poet because he has never written a poem. He even dislikes poetry, I think. But everything he has written is a poem in the best as well as in the broadest sense of the word. Secondly, I do not call him a writer but an author. The writer is the fly in the ointment of modern letters. Miller has waged ceaseless war against writers. If one had to type him, one might call him a wisdom writer. Wisdom literature being a type of literature which lies between literature and scripture. It is poetry only because it rises above literature and because it sometimes ends up in Bibles. I wrote to the British poet and novelist Lawrence Durrell last year, Durrell I mentioned in Paris, and said, let's put together a Bible of Miller's work. I thought I was being original calling a Bible. And you highlighted this, so I'm going to read your highlight. And then read I'll, my highlight. Then I'll stop. Let's assemble a Bible from his work, I said, and put one in every hotel room in America after removing the Gideon Bibles and placing them in the laundry chutes. Wow. Oh, you! Ah, that's great that you highlight. I highlight, this stuff. I highlight all the books that I read. That's awesome. Let me. I just so, want to see you wrote the intro. So we're gonna we're, call Shapiro. We're gonna uh, do Henry Miller book roulette today. I've got all mm. my Henry Miller books on the table here, and we're gonna pull quotes and just read different pages. Awesome. So are we gonna while you're that? grabbing while you're while you're grabbing books and stuff? I. Uh, I want to read through, I want to read from quotes from this. Now, what this, is that? This is a series of books that came out on different writers' lives. Mm, and, mm. and it's called Critical Lives, this series of books. Nice. And this one is the one on Henry Miller. And I absolutely love this book because uh, it, it talks about every aspect of his life. It's written by David Stephen Coloni. So, like, check this out. Like, when Miller is living in New York. Uh-huh. He loved this guy. He would go see him all the time. This 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 black guy who was a socialist. This is Hubert Harrison. Okay. Um, let's see if I'm. What do you think of Miller's politics? It seems like he, he was re- a, he was a communist, and then he um, he and, see, and, rejected it all after a while. But then he rejected it. Yeah. Um. Because you know, because the the. the Communism is 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 bloody and ruthless, and it became that. Right, it became that. It, it was idealistic, you know, each according to his needs, each according to his ability. But it got perverted big time, and you know, the Soviet Union. Yeah, the, I mean, on paper, it's a great idea. I mean, the right. French Revolution started with with noble aspirations, and then that turned into a bloodbath and no due process of law. And in communism, there's no due process of law. And you're fucked yeah. if the wrong person says, stick it to this punk. So, but he, so he really loved this. So let me, okay, so as the, Russian re, as the Russian Revolution broke out, the topics of Lenin and Trotsky were in the air. Miller stood on 14th Street, Union Square, listening to Emma Goldman, the longshoreman Jim Larkin, and, as we have seen, immersed himself in Kropotkin. Who's, ah, Kropotkin. Whose book, Bread, Miller considered to be the Bread? World. The it's world, the work of a saint. Miller also was enraptured by brilliant soapbox speeches in Madison Square mm. by the supremely gifted socialist Hubert Harrison. In Plexus, he movingly recalled Harrison's profound dignity, self-possession, and electric poetic power, which made the white men around him seem to Miller 
to be like cultural and spiritual pygmies. Ooh. That was William Henry Harrison? Hubert Harrison. This, Hubert. That's his picture right there. Oh, okay. Cultural pygmies? Well, that's meaning... cool. the, the, the socialist guy is giving these, these soapbox speeches. And, okay. And Miller's transfixed. Yeah. What did he mean by turning white men into human pygmies? What do you think Just he meant Just that they were unevolved, that they were oh, okay. small. Okay. Gotcha. In comparison. Gotcha. That this guy was a gotcha. giant. And they right. were in thought right. and stature and dignity. Right. And, and right. The, um, mm-hmm. these other white men were pygmies. So um, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna read through these highlights of, from this book. Yeah. No child could welcome its mother with more eagerness than I welcomed the sight of Europe. Miller loved bicycle riding, so he mm. and June bought bikes and set off on a tour suggested to them by sculptor Osip Zadkin, whom June had met during her earlier trip to Paris. Auxerre, I can't pronounce these French towns. Visale, Lyon, Easy, and you've been there. You should. You Monte should. Carlo, Nice, the Chateau of Bocari, through the Rhone Valley to Avignon. One town, Tarascon, particularly fascinated Miller because of Alphonse Dudet's Tartarin. So he made a special visit there. Okay, sorry, that wasn't. Okay, and feel free to. Okay. <clears throat> What I want to do is write stuff that has real guts. Not just the phony sentimental stuff that's called Mm. realism today, Mm. but something that gets right down to the bone. See, can I interrupt you? Oh, Oh, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Hard, honest realism. He was now writing from the top of his head and had initiated a new form, autobiography as novel. What I want to say about that is that's why Miller inspires me as a comic. Because I was talking to another comedian last night about what the fuck, why isn't anybody talking about the comedians? Why aren't comedians talking about the dystopia the United States has become? And Miller, with that paragraph you read, says, I don't want to write about bullshit. I don't want to write you know, candy assed. I don't want I wanna write about the fucking truth. And he he was about the truth. I remember a quote from him, something about the truth is always a very cruel mistress. You know? And as a comedian, great line that drives me, you know, to like get up there and just kinda speak the truth. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, to get up on stage and speak the truth. But, and you'll know this too, it's a fucked up thing as a comedian because you're trying to make the masses laugh and you know that's your number one job, is to make them laugh. So I'm always torn when I'm on stage because I, I feel like I, 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 I sell myself out a lot by going, you know, talking about porn instead of what I really want to talk about sometimes. I, I don't know. Like you're that NPR porn bit is hilarious. Yeah, yeah, you're right, right. You don't, know that porn bit. Don't discount the value of, of, of a good joke. <laughs> yeah, no, but no, I know. What I know. You're saying because you're like, a great joke writer. I know what you're saying though, because like I've backed off mm-hmm. some of my Trump stuff because I was, it was angry. I mean, it was angry. You know, I, 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 I wrote it with hate in my heart <laughs> and, um, it turns people off. Like if you're in Vegas or fucking man, I do you play Vegas? I yeah. The, the I never do. Brad Garrett's and the Comedy Cellar and the Laugh Factory. Um, you know. Uh, uh, anyway, um, I just want to relate that quote to like being an artist. I think that kind of is the crux of it, man. Is being willing to get down into your shit and your take on the world and fucking and, and I don't know if this is idealistic especially for a comic because we're we're talking about making people laugh but like kind of opening yourself up and being really super vulnerable like reading Miller's work it's got this incredible juxtaposition of vulnerability and and like a hard fuck you you know what I mean? Like, he's got those two... Isn't that what you and I are both striving for? <laughs> I, I think so. But, like, how far do you push it as a comedian um, without he, losing a lot of the audience? But, I mean, like, 
Mm. I, I don't know who are these people that could still be. Who supporting are these this, people? Who that they could be supporting this program? That are upset by a comedian giving his opinion when the fucking democracy is falling apart. <laughs> I don't. Well, that's what's wrong with the quote unquote democracy. You know what I mean? That's Everyone gets to vote. <laughs> no, I mean you got to let artists do their thing. Um, but what I wanted to say is, if you Google it, I don't know if you got the computer out, but uh, Miller, I remember reading a chapter or a long rant, Miller on comedians. He says, maybe I should have been a comedian. He said this well, in that, one of his books. Smile, you, smile at the foot of the ladder is about uh, a clown. Maybe a it's clown. In, it's in that I don't thing. think it's in there. It, I think it's in one of the Tropic books. I, I don't know where it was, but he said, maybe I should have been a comedian. Okay. He's, and he's, because what he said, he said, he said, I underestimated comedy. He said, you can do so much with comedy. Miller talked about how comedy is an incredible art form that lets you do a lot of things and it can be very subversive. Where is the subversiveness in comedy now, Tom? Do you, do you think there is, where is the real subversiveness in it? You know, I think it's in it when, does anything come up with the Google of Miller on Comedians? That'd be a tough one. But where is the subversiveness in comedy these days. I, I, I think comics are getting more and more... Um, safe? Safe, you know? Are, and, and that's fear. That's fear, you know? There, there's so much fear in the country right now. And we were talking before we went on the air about uh, how human nature has never changed. You were talking about Napoleon and, uh, you know, there's fear, there's greed, there's anger. Right? Yeah. Okay, nothing's popping up. Okay, that's the... okay. That's okay. But anyway, he talked about uh, comedians and how he, he thought maybe he should have played the jester. You know, maybe he should have been a comedian. And uh, the anarchy of the Marx Brothers he might have been referring to. You know, the anarchy of comedy. You know, that spirit of... Uh, be the spirit of comedy, right? It's very, very anarchic, isn't it? When we're fucking having I th at fun. At its best. At its best. Yeah. Yeah, when we're having fun on stage, man, it's all about fuck every, uh, fuck every convention, you know, uh, let's just play. And Miller was really playful. He was. And, uh, and very much a comedian on the, on the page. Absolutely. Um, okay, so let me read a few more. Although, and then Tropic of Cancer, there was big obscenity trials. That's, yeah. you know, he's kind of the Lenny Bruce of right. of American authors because th they had trials for Tropic of Cancer, mm -hmm. you know, and this is years after he wrote it. Mm -hmm. He's living in Big Sur and... Uh, all these obscenity trials are going on, and then he it, wrote it in Big Sur. No, 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 no. This is he wrote it years before okay. living in Paris. Oh, okay, right. Um, and then that was the book that basically allowed um, free expression in in uh, in books in the print. Of yeah, book. yeah, yeah. So I think he got pigeonholed as this like, oh, Miller writes dirty stuff, yeah. and. That's just scratching the surface of Miller, even though he wrote a lot. Mm -hmm. I mean, his sexual stuff was, man, it, it was truth, you know, like hot. just I would hot. Say, yeah. I would say that when I describe Henry Miller, I just go like, he'll describe what he did with his dick that day for like five pages. And yeah. then he'll say the most profound truth on humanity and, yeah. and living life. Right, right. That, that's what was awesome about him going from like primal C, right? Being primal and then going to complete cerebral, ethereal, ph philosophical, you know? I don't think mu uh, many people know that side of him, that incredible, you know, philosophical side of him. No, no you don't hear many people even mention him anymore. No, it was not on Dalia's last special. He didn't mention Miller. <laughs> 
Um, I think he's I think he's one of the greatest American writers of all time. One of the greatest writers of all time. Oh uh, yeah. Although Tropic of Cancer would make Miller famous due to its explosive sexual language, mm. the book is the first in his long autobiographical sequence about the struggle for spiritual evolution. Mm. As he said, liberally larded with the sexual as was that work, the concern of its author was not with sex nor with religion, but the problem but with the problem of self liberation. Yeah. He gets pushed down to the bottom, and when this happens, he waits patiently and floats back to the top. As in mm. the mystical tradition, there is a death of the old self and a rebirth of the new. The rosy crucifixion. That's what crucifixion is. It's the death of the ego and the birth of, you know, the enlightened. Your new aware self. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He was like, you know, he was like a, a hardcore Jesus in a way. A uh, hip Jesus, like Lord Buckley, if you know Lord Buckley at all. Yeah, Lord... Um, uh, the Naz, Lord Buckley. Yeah, I, I haven't heard Lord Buckley in a long time. The, yeah. um, comedian, he used to have acid parties up at Lake Arrowhead. Yeah. You ever hear about that? Yes. Yes. There was like all these uh, mattresses that fell off of a military truck. Yes. And he took them out to his property and he'd invite all these people from Hollywood up to Lake Arrowhead. Yeah. Yeah. And they'd all do acid. I had his daughter on my podcast last week, Lori. Really? Yeah. Talking about all that stuff, like how Buckley would just, Lord Buckley would just go off. You know, he'd be flying on acid and he would just go off, like just do his speeches for a long time. <laughs> And uh, I was buddy with Jerry Stiller, and Jerry used to say, why didn't Lord Buckley tape his stuff or write it down? He didn't write it down, and it went into the ether. You yeah, know? totally. Um, Balzac's inner struggle mirrored Miller's own lifelong obsession to reveal his essential innocence. The liberation of the angel within mm-hmm. is the ultimate purpose of human life. Ooh, that's beautiful. And who did he quote on that one? Balzac. Oh, yeah, because he... That there was a similarity in... He quoted Balzac a lot. And um, <clears throat> did Balzac write The Decline of Western Civilization? Which was no. the... No. It was something yeah, let me, about... Let me look at the Balzac. Uh, <laughs> Do you have some Balzac? Are you kidding me? I don't know if you heard that joke. That I, I was invited to perform in Paris because they heard that my specialty was talking about the French author Balzac. But when I got there, they found out my specialty was talking about my ball sack. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Balzac wrote the human comedy, mm-hmm. Cousin Betty, mm-hmm. Treatise on Elegant Living is a great book, on uh, Père Giraud, Eugene Gannett. Uh-huh. Uh, Let me ask you this. Did you get those Balzac books because of Miller? No, just because I'm, oh. I, I'm, I, 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 I love the French authors. Oh, okay, and uh, I've never read any Balzac, but I've. But they're I, there. I, they're there, and they're ready when I'm ready. Yeah, yeah. I have a lot of. It's books. The nice thing about amassing a, a nice library. Totally, man. You spend your life going to used bookstores. You know, you. Oh my God! There's a Balzac for a dollar. You know. Every man who is uniquely himself comes face to face eventually with the true dragon. Mm. which is the self, mm. and which must be slain in order to make the final reconciliation. <sighs> this supreme acceptance of life as a life and death process saves one for the world eternally. That's from Miller? Uh, That's a quote from Miller. Yeah? Yes. Um, do you realize how Buddhist that is? Like, you know, how just... It's the essence of, like, Buddhism, Zen, like, to fucking, you know, just acceptance. It's, it's what's kind of, you know, uh, the Eckhart Tolle sensation in this country is all about just being in the present moment, like, shedding your fucking mind, shedding your demons, you know? It's the well, shedding I, of the demons. It was a joke I wrote um, mm-hmm. about five years ago. My wife... Kept trying to get me to read this Eckhart Tolle book, The Power of Now, but I was too busy living in the moment to read it. <laughs> <laughs> Eckhart would approve of that joke. 
Miller declared that to read Fechner is to understand that the whole universe is not only alive in a way that surpasses all comprehension, but that everything in the universe, man, beast, flower, star, is connected and interrelated. Oh, that's so... It's just... I got that from Mushrooms. Ah, did you? Yeah. Absolutely, right? Yeah, you feel like, oh my God. Were they cremini, portobello? What what were the mushrooms? Because I know you love Italy. Shiitake. Shiitake, Japanese, baby. (laughs) Um, Oh my God, here you go. Yeah. One night, Charlie Chaplin was also a guest, and there was much laughter and revelry. Chaplin elaborated this theory of artistic creativity. Ooh, Chaplin. This is when they're, they're in Paris. Yeah. And Chaplin says, We're all of us psychos, but a few, like the three of us, are unbelievably lucky. Ooh. When they feel a crisis coming on, they don't have to spend a lot of money on psychoanalysis. You start writing. I make a film. Mm. And we're temporarily cured. Wow. And we get paid for it to boot. Wow, that's a great, that's a great, that's from Chaplin, huh? Chaplin said that. Because I feel like that. Like if, you, you know well, what? Well, that's I, the thing, like creativity makes me happy. That's and then, right. I mean, and even if, like I'm, I'm, I'm trying to uh, finish this book about traveling, and right now I'm working on this Israel chapter where I took my mother to Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. And like even, like there's been like days where I've sat here for five hours and only banged out like one or two paragraphs. Oh yeah. But still, it feels good. It's uh, it's it, it, something is coming out of me. It's it's even though that struggle can. And I'm, be... not, I'm not frustrated at all. It's like, You're not. That's what it took that day to produce one paragraph. Yeah. And then other days I can bang out friggin' five ten pages. Yeah. Okay. That's cool. Yeah. Um, some some things. You know, I was I was I was writing about um, this part about my feelings about my mother, and, it, and I she's still with us. Yes, mm-hmm. and so I I needed mm-hmm. to um, uh, get it out. It it just took a while to yeah capture the the thoughts, what I wanted to say. You could see like I, I, I had to meditate. <laughs> I mean, not meditate, but you know, what I'm saying I did. I did. Yeah, I did you had reflect. to reflect. Con- contemplatively, like, kind of look inside. But it was interesting about Chaplin because there was a great sadness to his films, I think. The Tramp character, you know, and his, like... He gave dignity to poverty with the Absolutely, Tramp absolutely. Why can't you have dignity even if you're poor? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, his, his like, attractions in the movies, like, his... There was just a sadness to Chaplin, but he was a brilliant brilliant clown you know also a renowned fucking perfectionist he would drive actors nuts he would do hundreds of takes yeah you know that but he also wrote all the music for all of his films i didn't know that he was uh he wrote classical music he loved classical music and he wrote classical music um in his spare time or whatever i mean he was by the way when you said that us three, it was Chaplin Miller. Do you know who the third person was? If not, that's cool. But uh, I was just wondering, you know, uh, he said, you write. In early November, they left they. for George's Simeon, Simeon's, Simeon's, oh. Simeon's Chateau in Appelingers near Luzon, where Miller spent four days. Oh, okay. Okay, so, I don't know so that he's dude. with George Simeon. Yeah. Um, here you go. This is from Sexus. A man throws off the poison which he has accumulated because of his false way of life. Wait, Mm. no, no, wait, wait. A man writes, very important, sorry. A man writes to throw off the poison which he has accumulated because of his false way of life. He is trying to recapture his innocence, yet all he succeeds in doing by writing is to inoculate the world with the virus of his disillusionment. Ooh. No man would set a word down on paper if he had the courage to live out what he believed in. Wow. Wow. Well, Thanks. what about that? Hey. <laughs> I think I've lived a lot. I, did, I need to... It's time for me to sit in this apartment and reflect. Real, yeah, huh? Well, you've been all around the world. Yeah, I mean, and I, I'm going to Europe for June. You know, I it's when I say I'm, 
I was talking to somebody at the comedy store last night, and they were like, "Yeah." Uh, Steve Byrne was asking, "You've been traveling a lot?" I go, "No, no, no, not really." And then I was telling him, "Oh yeah, well I was in Vegas, Orlando, and Toronto, and oh well I guess yeah, but to me that's not traveling very much, right? You know? When it's a twelve-hour plane ride, you're traveling." His, his attraction to exotic and faraway places, he often spoke of desiring to visit Tahiti, Timbuktu, Lhasa, or Patagonia, is also a fle- reflection of this essentially romantic yearning for the place where the hidden secrets of existence may be revealed, a place which may lie just over the horizon. And I think that's why I've always traveled, looking for some secret pearl of, of wisdom or and knowledge. You, you must have seen and acquired a bunch. And that's why I'm writing this book. My best stories of traveling the world. What are you calling it? Do you know? Mm, hooray for humanity. Is that right? Yeah. That's kind of cool. Yeah, that's that's my uh, that's my slogan. Will it have anything to say about your book? Are you going to talk about how, like for instance, the rise of right-wing fascism again? That's been happening across Europe. Do you see any of that? I mean, uh, you know, fortunately, I've been living in Los Angeles since. I guess I am kind of like Henry Miller. When the Mm -hmm. Nazis took over, he was in Greece, and then he went to Big Sur. Right. Um, Right. I wasn't living in Europe when all this shit happened in the last five years. But you're going back. Yeah, and I've, 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 I, I go back once a year. I've, I've seen it, but it's, Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's not a part of my. Story, right? Okay. Uh, I mean, now, hopefully, yeah. Um, mm, mm, mm. Should I just open up? A- I want you to. That's why we have all these books on the table. Um, well, <laughs> and then I'm 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 keeping it going by. Um, I'll read you something from Tropic of Cancer. Do it. As I say, the day began gloriously. It was only this morning that I became conscious again of this physical Paris, of which I have been unaware for weeks. Perhaps it is because the book has begun to grow inside me. I am carrying it around with me everywhere. I walk through the streets, big with child, and the cops escort me across the street. Women get up to offer me their seats. Nobody pushes me rudely anymore. I am pregnant. I waddle awkwardly, my big stomach pressed against the weight of the world. He's talking about birthing his big his book. book. Yeah. Yeah, isn't that funny? It's beautiful. <clears throat> There's nothing wrong with life itself. It is the ocean in which we swim, and we either adapt to it or sink to the bottom. But it is in our power as human beings not to pollute the waters of life not to destroy the spirit which animates us. Mm. See, he really he really was talking about god damn it, I'm going to have joy. This is his crux in a way. I'm going to have joy in the face of all the shit. Yes. In the face of all the inner demons and the outer demons. I'm still, and maybe that's what that's the lesson we should learn from today. Is it? I mean, don't you think? I mean, it. That's a great. That that was basically the way he was living his life. Yeah. No matter what, and no matter what the circumstances of my life, no matter how broke I am, no matter how heartbroken or how Mm. shitty things are with. Well, I'll tell you why that's important right now, and this has gone on. You know, I mean, people. Everybody's talking about it. Mental health now in the United States, suicide rates are up, 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 up. People are just despairing. Just checking out. They're checking out, man. This opioid crisis, you know, uh, it's driven by I I don't want to deal. I don't want to deal with this shit, you know? Yeah, people wanting to just numb themselves. Absolutely. You know, and I, I mean, I, I want to know myself too, but man, it's rewarding. What's your drug of choice? Um, well, it's, it's always been marijuana, you know, or what I like to call the hookah, the hookah dookie. <laughs> the jazz cigarettes. <laughs> the jazz cigarettes. No, yeah, I've always liked weed, you know, um, I've always liked weed. 
Um, I'm a fan myself. <laughs> I I see. <laughs> where, where do you see? Balcony. Oh, there, there's no weed out there. Yes, there is. No, there was last year. That I, I failed when I grew a couple plants. No, there's some roaches. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I thought you were talking about the plants. Yeah, okay. Thanks for giving There's it, weed out there, bro. Thanks for giving it away. Now the Gestapo will kick in the doors. Oh, for fucking weed in Los Angeles? They'd be kicking in every door? <laughs> <laughs> who is the man who triumphs? The one who believes? Let the intelligent ones doubt. Criticize, categorize, and define. Mm. The man of heart believes. And the world belongs to him who believes most. Nothing is too silly, too trivial, too far-fetched, or too stupendous for man to believe. Learning crushes the spirit. Belief mm. open ones up, delivers one. Boy, that's beautiful. That is so beautiful. And that is about faith. That is about faith, and I struggle with faith. And it's a faith, it's not a, you know, it's a faith in life. It's, 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 it's being courageous. And he talks about it, you, you read it, like to live your life because when you don't hold anything back, which Miller is talking about, you're risking everything. You're risking everything. And, you know, again, to bring it back to what we do for a living, comedy, when you get up there, we, we risk getting our asses kicked. I have a joke where I go, let me tell you, folks, if you're not in show business, you're a fucking coward. And I'm talking about <laughs> first responders, everybody, because I put my ass on the line every fucking night, you know, while you all are like, oh, the firemen, the firemen, bullshit. I'm up here exposing myself, you know. I do shit like that, which I love it. which has a kernel of truth in it, you know. I agree. I think I've had an overabundance of faith in my life. The way, you know, I've, I've moved to New York a couple times, moved to San Francisco. Um, you know, I just moved to San Amsterdam. I, I fucked off to Europe for five years. You had a show. I did, I did two TV shows. On two? Days. Yeah, I, a late night talk show and then... Um, they let me be a presenter on a travel show for a year. Boy, I like Amsterdam. It's well, I love like it so much. I moved there, you know. And then I didn't live anywhere for ten years. And then you I, didn't you you just I traveled? put everything into storage and I traveled the world as a comedian. <sighs> yeah, that's so awesome. like my whole life has been I've been, I've seen this all as investing in my life as a comedian because to be a comedian you have to have experiences to talk about. So I've taken these great risks for love and. Also, for my, my, my story bank. Absolutely. I mean, it was great. You were showing me all your comedy journals, you know? The and joke books. Joke books. But they're really the history of your life, you know? They are. You, you can go through there. I mean, especially back when I was, like, doing drugs. It's like some mm -hmm. of, the, some of the, the scribbles are unintelligible. But mm -hmm. you can also look back and see all the rela different relationships I was having. And people I was writing with, and then like right, or uh, living with, or in love with, and then the, the after. Oh, so it was stream of consciousness too? No, but it's mostly. Well, I mean, sometimes I would write about events and journal okay. things, but mostly it's jokes and thoughts That's and awesome. ideas. That's awesome. And then so there's a lot. There's a lot of heartbreak. There's a lot of joy. This mm -hmm. is like every period of my life is in those books. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, you got a lot of books in you. I think. I think I've got. A, I think I got a couple. You know. I'm only going to write one book. I haven't gotten around to it yet, but it's going to be about Mick Jagger. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> As the Zen masters say, think only and entirely and completely of what you are doing at the moment, and you are as free as a bird. Mm. No Westerner wants to accept such a statement, naturally. It seems too simple to be true. Mm. We prefer to complicate things with our prejudices, our principles, our beliefs, our judgments. And so we continue to feed the machine which grinds us to nothingness. You see that? That's capitalism he's talking about. Yes, and that's pure Henry Miller right there. Yeah. Yeah. So that's all that all that everything I just read was is from that Critical Lives book on Henry Miller by David Stephen. Oh, I want to get that. I, yeah. I want to get that one because that seems like just a good summation of what he's about. 
Yes. You know, and I've read a lot of the books. <clears throat> but that but also, of... it says, it, it, uh, I, was, I was flipping through there last night to prepare myself for this. And uh, it said in there he had a, a correspondence with Charles Bukowski. I didn't know you were telling me that yeah. today. And then, like, and then the, the Hubert Harrison guy, the... That he idolized this black socialist guy who was giving speeches at Madison Square Garden. I like all these little details. Whatever about became of you, but Harrison? Did you ever <clears throat> look that up? No, or I don't know. Okay, I'm going to look that up. Why don't you? Uh, why don't you um... This is from Tropic of Cancer. I must say right at the start that I haven't a thing to complain about. It's like being in a lunatic asylum with permission to masturbate. For the rest of your life, the world is brought right under my nose and all that is requested of me is to punctuate the calamities. And I relate to that a lot because I masturbate. You punctuate calamities all the time. I do. <laughs> you are a master at punctuating calamity. Yes, yes. And masturbate, you know, whenever anyone talks about masturbation, I get excited. I mean... I just, uh, you know, I masturbate. You know what I mean? If you, if you don't mind, Tom, I'd like to step into the other room and uh, <laughs> complete. No. Wouldn't it be funny if you're fit? I'll just keep on reading and uh, <laughs> hear, you, hear you in the back, in the next room. <laughs> It'd be funny because I, I, my sister got me the Apple Watch for Christmas. So the only thing I find useful on it is that it has this fitness thing. Yeah. And so it would, and you're supposed to close three rings every day. You know, it's a program they give you, whatever, based on your height, weight, you know, uh, zest for life. <laughs> and it goes, uh, one is movement, one is strength, and one is whatever. But it'd be funny if, the, if I was closing rings on masturbation, like if it was a masturbation uh, watch. Um, okay. That'll be, uh, you know, and you can see, so we both, you can see I've read Tropic of Cancer twice because... Are we both quoting we're, from cancer? We're both holding Tropic of Cancer, and I've highlighted both books, so I've, oh, I've read this one twice. I want to read this one. And it's not one of my... It, it, it's. Yeah, I thought it wasn't one of my favorites, but as I was reading the highlights last night, I was like, holy fuck, this is it's amazing. A, well, book. that's why I talk about going back to Miller. Like, every great writer or every great work of art, like, there's films I can watch... Over and over. Over yeah. and over again. Um... What's the film? Big Lebowski is one for me. Sexy uh, Beast is one of my favorites. Oh, I I've, haven't seen that in a while. I've watched that like 40, 50 times. Oh, shit. Uh, True Romance. That's, another. that's a good one. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, that's good that you reminded me about Sexy Beast and True Romance. I'm just trying to think of the one I... Oh, oh as far as comedy goes, man. Alan Arkin and Peter Falk in The In-Laws. Just, I, I can watch it. I haven't a lot. seen that. Before. But here's one. The man next to me is sleeping soundly. He looks like a broker with his big paunch and his waxed mustache. I like him thus. I like especially that big paunch and all that went into making into the making of it. Why shouldn't he sleep soundly? If he wants to listen, he can always rustle up the price of a ticker of a ticket. I notice that the better dressed they are, the more soundly they sleep. They have an easy conscience, the rich. If a poor man dozes off, even for a few seconds, he feels mortified. He imagines that he has committed a crime against the composer. Ooh, wow. This is from Tropic of Cancer 2. Page 9. I recall distinctly how I enjoyed my suffering. It was like taking a cub to bed with you. Once in a while, he clawed you, and then you were really frightened. Ordinarily, you had no fear. You could always turn him loose or chop his head off. There are people who cannot resist the desire to get into a cage with wild beasts and be mangled. They go in even without a revolver or whip. Fear makes them fearless. Ooh. Boy, I wish I could say I was like that. Except I'm like that with stand up. With stand up, that's where we get the, you know, the that bravery and conquering fear. Yes. But yeah, and in But in, other things in, in life, life scare the in real life I can 
be a coward. Me too. Me too. I remember there was a guy at the bank a couple of years ago, and he was the line was really long, and he was yelling at the tellers, and fuck this place, and fuck every one of you. That was me. And I'm thinking, those tellers are making a little above minimum wage. Right, right. It's not their fault the place is understaffed by this big corporation. He should be yelling at the managers. True. Not the fucking the front line team. True. He should, you know what I'm saying? But and I thought to myself. Say something, don't say something. And then, and then I... I well, yeah, I mean, you know... You are out of order, sir. <laughs> you know, if you would have said it like that, he would have been like, oh, shit, this is some 19th century shit coming <laughs> at me now. People are like lice. They get under your skin and bury themselves there. You scratch and scratch until the blood comes, but you can't get permanently deloused. Everywhere I go, people are making a mess of their lives. Everyone has his private tragedy. Mm. Yeah, man. I mean, I mean, the one thing in common of all these passages that we're reading is that none of it sugarcoats anything. None of it is like, I don't know, none of it is candy-ass. You know yeah. what I mean? I'll just, I'm just opening up a book. This is The Rosie Crucifixion. This is Sexist, Volume 3. And I remember, you remember him writing about Kronsky in, in this Rosie Crucifixion? Do you remember the character Kronsky? He's just a, the piano was cl- completely out of tune. Kronsky's wife, a timid, mouse-like creature whose mouth seemed to be curled in a perpetual, deprecating smile used to sit and practice the scales on this instrument, oblivious, apparently, of the hideous dissonances which her nimble fingers produced. To hear her play the barcarolle, for example, was excruciating. She seemed not to hear the sour notes, the jangled chords. She played with an expression of utter serenity, her soul enwrapped, her senses numbed and bewitched. It was a venomous composure which deceived no one, not even herself. For the moment her fingers ceased wandering, she became what in truth she was, a petty, mean, spiteful, malevolent little bitch. (laughs) That was, and he wrote that on Valentine's Day, (laughs) which is coming up. But again, man, it's like there's a rage and a, there's a rage to his work. He rages against, and I think good comedians do this too, he rages against the pettiness, yes. the stupidity of life. Like why, like for, with this woman, he's saying why, basically he, he's going after her because he's like, why be petty? You know, why be petty when there's all this life to access, all this joy to access, you know? I agree. Yeah, he, he, he nails it, you know? Um, I, I, I just, Let's I see did, what you got. I, I love the guy's spirit, love his heart, uh, and his balls. In the person <laughs> of Gandhi, they are experiencing for a brief moment the miracle of unity. But when he goes, there will be a crash. An utter relapse into that strife and chaos so characteristic of the Indian people. The young Hindu, of course, is optimistic. He has been to America and has been contaminated by the cheap idealism of the Americans. Mm. Contaminated by the ubiquitous bathtub, the five and ten cent store, bric-a-brac, the bustle, the efficiency, the machinery the high wages, the free li- libraries, etc., etc. His ideal would be to Americanize India. Ah, awesome. I mean, that's the consumeristic bullshit. This is from... Yeah, he wrote this, that's, I mean, he wrote that like in the early 30s. Unbelievable to me that he did it back then. Like, And now India probably has been Americanized a lot. It has been. It has I've been. I've never been. I I have not either. I I just know it has been. Um, in one, this is from the Air Condition Nightmare. Brilliant book. This this is he wrote this book when he returned to America, and he took a um, 
a drive around America with a friend of his. They took a road trip all over America, and that's when this is. So this is. I remember when I moved back from Europe, like coming back to the United States was like visiting a foreign country. Yeah, and this he, is, this he's is, writing about the South here. He goes, uh, I have come across two cities which, ha- which e- have each of them a little section worth a second look. I mean, Charleston and New Orleans. As for the other cities, towns and villages through which I passed, I hope never to see them <laughs> again. Some of them have such marvelous names, too, which only makes the deception more cruel. Names like Chattanooga, Pensacola, Tallahassee, like Mantua, Phoebus, Bethlehem, Paoli, like Algiers, Mobile, Natchez, Savannah, like Baton Rouge, Saginaw, Poughkeepsie, names that revive glorious memories of the past or awaken dreams of the future. Visit them, I urge you. See for yourself. Try to think of Schubert or Shakespeare when you are in Phoebus, Virginia. Try to think of North Africa when you are in, when you are in Algiers, Louisiana. Try to think of the life the Indians once led here when you were on a lake, a mountain, or river because be bearing the names we borrowed from from them. Try to think of the dreams of the Spaniards when you are motoring over the old Spanish trail. Walk around in the old French quarter of New Orleans and try to reconstruct the life that once this city knew. Less than a hundred years has elapsed since the jewel of America faded out. It seems more like a thousand. Wow. Wow. I mean, that paragraph alone was worth us getting together today. Absolutely. Just to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's inspired me. Like, after this, after this pod, I'm going to uh, run home and do some writing, you know? Cool. Do you have a little more time? Yeah, I have a little more time. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the whole point about Bessie was that she couldn't or just wouldn't regard herself as a lay. She talked about passion as if it were a brand new word. She was passionate about things, even a little thing like a lay. She had to put her soul into it. Mm. My kind of girl. (laughs) Woman. Woman. Woman, woman. (laughs) Uh, If there were a man who dared to say all that he thought of this world, there would not be left a square foot of ground to stand on. When a man appears, the world bears down on him and breaks his back. There are always too many rotten pillars left standing. Too much festering humanity for a man to bloom. The superstructure is a lie, and the foundation is a huge quaking fear. If at intervals of centuries there does appear a man with a desperate, hungry look in his eye, a man who would turn the world upside down in order to create a new race, The love that he brings to the world is turned to the bile, and he becomes a scourge. If now and then we encounter pages that explode, pages that would wound and sear, that wring groans and tears and curses, know that they come from a man with his back up, a man whose only defenses left are his words, and his words are always stronger than the lying, crushing weight of the world. Stronger than all the racks and wheels which the cowardly invent to crush out the miracle of personality. If any man ever dared to translate all that is in his heart to put down what is really his experience, what is truly his truth, I think then the world would go to smash, that it would be blown to smithereens, and no God, no accident, no will could ever again assemble the pieces the atoms, the indestructible elements that have gone to make up the world. Wow. Wow. Yeah, he basically talks about the world, in quotes, being a construct for misery because of all the fucking lies. And, I mean, he talks about it in the air-conditioned nightmare, but, you know, it's greed, You know, that's one way to put it. It's just accumulating things, you know, accumulating things instead of being in touch with your fucking truth, you know. 
And that is such a great passage about if a, if a man... Wrote down what was truly his experience. It would, ex- it would smash the world. And this is air-conditioned nightmare again. Of course, Detroit isn't the worst place, not by a long shot. That's what I said about Pittsburgh. That's what I'll say about other places, too. None of them is the worst. There is no worst or worstest. The worst is in process of becoming. It's inside us now, only we haven't brought it forth. Disney dreams about it, and he gets paid for it. That's the curious thing. People bring their children to look and scream with laughter. Ten years later, it happens now and then that they fail to recognize the little monster who so joyfully clapped his hands and screamed with delight. It's always hard to believe that a Jap, that a Jack the Ripper could have sprung out of your own loins. However, it's cold in Detroit. A gale is blowing happily. I am not one of those without work, without food, without shelter. I am stopping at the gay Detroiter, the mecca of the futilitarian salesman. I mean, he just goes on, man. It's yeah. like one long... You know what Miller's writing is like? It's like one long book. It's like one long book, all of it. Well, you know how Kerouac is known for this stream of consciousness, and he got that, obviously, from Miller. He worshipped Henry Miller. He did. I didn't know that, and, and I really... I mean, all the beats were, were hugely influenced by him. The, the, I didn't know before, that. Did know, he they, hang with them? No. They had just read his books. They got a hold of I him. I wonder why they didn't hang with Miller. He probably wouldn't have wanted anything to do with them. You think? Why? I think Miller was his own guy. He was this kind of mystical entity. He chose his friends carefully. I mean, I think uh. he... Uh, you know, uh, once he started making money, when he didn't have to get the free meals and stuff. Right. But right. Um, I, I don't. I, I don't know. I think he was on a higher spiritual plane than Kerouac was a unfettered alcoholic. I mean, he was. I uh, loved Kerouac when I was so, younger, so and, and one of the reasons I moved to San Francisco. Yeah, I I loved his books. I on the road is fucking amazing. It's one of my favorite books. Uh, the um. Big Sir and the Oranges of Hieronymus Bosch? No, that's, that's Henry Miller. Okay, well, there's one that Kerouac wrote, wrote it when he he was in Big Sir. He wrote a book called Big Sir. Oh, okay. That was yeah. an incredible book. Um, the other one, uh, Desolation Angels. Oh, that's a, an incredible book. On too. the Road, Desolation Angels. I'm reading off the shelf. Oh, cool. Um, those are my two favorite Kerouac books. I like Big Sir, man. That was a kind of... You know, at the end of his life and alcoholism was just fucking murdering him. And I just brought that up because I I guess Miller would not hang around with someone who was kind of fucking... No, and then Miller was also um, vehemently against war of any kind. And Kerouac, at the end of his life, you know, the the hippies embraced Kerouac Mm -hmm. and also Henry Miller for this, like... You know, living for experience. And, you, you know, it, it does give me hope. You hear about millennials now are more into experiences than they are materialism. And that's like basically what Henry Miller and Kerouac were all about. But Jack Kerouac would go on these talk shows in America yeah. in the early 70s and he was drunk and he didn't like the hippies and he was pro Vietnam War. He was pro Vietnam War? Pro Vietnam War. Kerouac? Kerouac. How does, I, that doesn't jive Look in up my... on, on YouTube. You can see clips of him on these talk shows and he's. How does he justify it? And communism? The, the fight just, against communism? I guess. Wow, that, that doesn't jive in my head. And so I don't, think, I don't think Henry Miller would have um, yeah. tolerated that shit. Yeah. Uh, so this is, and I, of the Rosie Crucifixion, Sexus is my favorite. Mm. This is from Sexus. Every day we slaughter our finest impulses. Mm. That is why we get a heartache. And when we read those lines written by the hand of a master and recognize them as our own, as the tender shoots which we stifled because we lacked the faith to believe in our own powers, our own criterion of truth and beauty, every man, when he gets quiet, when he becomes desperately honest with himself, is capable of uttering profound truths. Mm. We all derive from the same source. There is no mystery about the origin of things. We are all part of creation. All kings, all poets, all musicians. We have only to open up, only to discover what is already there. 
that is so fucking, you know, Buddhist. It's, it, you know, because I, lately I've been drawn so much to like listening to this esoteric spirituality from the East, like uh, Sri Nisgard, Maharaj Nisgardate is like, he, he has a book called I Am That. It's just a compilation of his talk. And, and, and what Tolle talks about, what, you know, this whole tradition of like, we have everything. We have everything. It's right here. But the whole we, of the universe is inside of us. But here's the thing, and I'm distressed about this. Our quiet is robbed from us. And I'm an addict with this shit too. The internet, the, the buzz of all the social media that as a comic I get involved with. But Everything's then, snatching your attention. Yeah, and and we think we're doing the right thing by going on social media and being part of things. The as, conversation. The conversation. Fuck the conversation. Dude, the Instagram real... Instagram is not life. The, that's right. Nothing online is. No. Uh, I mean, you can meet some nice people. Wink, wink. <laughs> but um, But it's like... The biggest thing is to get quiet. And how do you how do you get quiet in this world? You have a nice refuge here. Yeah, uh, this is my, I like my sanctuary. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a beautiful refuge. But you know, I'm a reader. If you, 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 you at the airports, airports are the noisiest place in the world. Yeah, there's constant CNN on the screens, uh. and, and you try and get away from the TV, and then the fucking they've got speakers on the back rows above on the ceiling. There's nowhere you can go. I That's mean, insanity. The only the first class lounge is quiet. And what you're getting in there is you're paying for the fucking quiet. For the quiet. Because the regular terminals and the waiting areas of airports are the noisiest fucking places in America. Yeah. Yeah. And you sit there, I'm sitting there. That's why I've, I've, I've read so much is because I've traveled so much. And yeah. I, always, I always enjoy flying because I sit there and bang out the fucking pages. Yeah. But, you ever do audio books or you'd rather read nah, it? No, nah. no. Mm. I mean, I like those great courses. Oh, I, right. I used to listen to those all the time. Oh, cool, yeah. Uh, but not audio. Books. I like them on planes, audio Really? Books. I don't know why. I, I just put them, I put them on and it just, you know, I wake up in the middle of uh, a book, <laughs> you know. I do got to run. Do you really? You, you got a couple yeah. minutes? Come on, you haven't read anything from Colossus of Marusi yet. Okay, this time you've got a real woman. A real woman, Mr. Miller. Expect, expect something of a man. Not just words and gestures. If she wants you to run away with her, to leave your wife, your child, your job, I'd say do it. Listen to her, not to your own selfish promptings. He slumped back in his seat and picked his teeth. After a pause, and you, meet her, and you met her in a dance hall. Well, I must congratulate you for having the sense to recognize the genuine article. That girl can make something of you, if you'll let her. If it's not too late, I mean. <clears throat> you're pretty far gone, you know. Another year with that wife of yours and you're finished. He spat on the floor in disgust. You have luck. You get things without working for them. I work like a son of a bitch, and the moment I turn my back, everything crumbles. Oof. Um, check this out. We were talking about Inner Peace, the Colossus of Marusi. Aren't you glad I highlight the books? Oh, it's awesome. <laughs> Because, you know, but you can open Miller anywhere and kind of, but this one is great. What man wants is peace in order that he may live. Defeating our neighbor doesn't give peace any more than curing cancer brings health. Man doesn't begin to live through triumphing over his enemy. That's why he's anti-war. Nor does he begin to acquire health through endless cures. The joy of life comes through peace, which is not static, but dynamic. No man can really say that he knows what joy is until he has experienced peace. And without joy, there is no life. Even if you have a dozen cars, six butlers, a castle, a private chapel, and a bomb-proof vault, our diseases are our attachments, be they habits, ideologies, ideals, principles, possessions, 
phobias, gods, cults, religions, what you please. Good wages can be a disease just as much as bad wages. Leisure can be just a great, as great a disease as work. Whatever we cling to, even if it be hope or faith, can be the disease which carries us off. Surrender is absolute. If you cling to even the tiniest crumb, you nourish the germ which will devour you. As for clinging to God, God long ago abandoned us in order that we might realize the joy of attaining Godhood through our own efforts. (laughs) Motherfucker. Wow. It's so fucking... Do you get into Buddhism, Eastern? I used to, yeah, when I lived in San Francisco. This is all they talk about yeah. is don't cling, don't have attachments. Your, uh, your, your possessions are the, uh, the source of your suffering, yeah. which is interesting because if you've ever been to Asia, which is where Buddhism is most prominent, um, Koreans yeah. and Japanese, they're like some of the most materialistic people on the planet. Yeah, well, they're, they're um, you know... Well, it's very alluring, attachment. The attachments are so alluring, man. I go into an electronic... I can't get rid of my books or my vinyl records. Well, you know what? That's a good attachment, I think. I mean, I know that he says <clears throat> even the tiniest crumb of attachment. And, and I think he, he's talking more about mentally. Like, our attachments are fucking mental. We go to therapists and psychiatrists because we're attached, let's say, to fear. We're attached to fucking thinking that fucking drives us nuts. And it's reinforced. You go to the airport and you see CNN. I can't take that. You know, sometimes in an airport, you know, when I don't have any first class, you know, bullshit, you know, elitist stuff that you have. I <laughs> fucking... <laughs> I f- I'm, I'm, I'm being downgraded on uh, Delta at the... the uh, at the end of January, so I no, I, I I will be in the economy line with everybody else. Well, I'm fucking with you, but um, it's like I wind up underneath the TV in an airport, and I hear that shit. It is insanity, and people act like everything is so fucking important on the news, and they become insane. And even what's going on right now in our country with the Trump impeachment trial. You know, I will not watch it. I will not sit and watch it because it 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 just seems like very presentational. I've been watching. They're they're presenting it like a court case, and they're doing it very beautifully using videos of things that people said. It's it's Mm -hmm. it's an excellent presentation. And now anybody could look at this evidence and go, "Yeah, let's keep this guy." (laughs) Or well, how could anybody look at this guy's behavior? And say, let's keep this guy. How can anybody look at this guy's behavior and elect him? How could the Christian populace of America go against everything that they believe and stand for and and support the guy Mm -hmm. who is the exact opposite of the teachings of Christ, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Our Lord and Savior. And, you know, I have to go, Tommy. Okay. Do you want to wrap it up with any? Yeah, particular? sure. Um, I love you, Eddie. I'm so glad that we. I'm did I'm so this. glad we did this too. It's uh, really. You want to? You want to read something else from that? Was a. I think that that quote probably is the one to end it on. Well, I'll I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll read you one more. I hear people talking about peace, and their faces are clouded with anger, or with hatred, or with scorn and disdain, with pride and arrogance. There are people who want to fight to bring about peace. The most deluded souls of all. There will be no peace until murder is eliminated from the heart and mind. Murder is the apex of the broad pyramid whose base is the self. That which stands will have to fall. Everything which man has fought fought for will have to be relinquished before he can begin to live as man. Up till now, he has been sick. He has been a sick beast, and even his divinity stinks. He is master of many worlds, and in his own, he is a slave. What rules the world is the heart, not the brain. In every realm, our conquests bring only death. Wow. 
We have turned our backs on the one realm where free, wherein freedom lies. At Epidaurus in the stillness, in the great peace that came over me. This is in Greece. I heard the heart of the world beat. I know what the cure is. It is to give up, to relinquish, to surrender, so that our little hearts may, be, may beat in unison with the great heart of the world. That's enlightenment speaking. Mm-hmm. Give up, relinquish fucking everything. Well, okay, listen to this. I know you got to go. We'll wrap this up. The great ones do not set up offices, charge fees, give lectures, or write books. Wisdom is silent, and the most effective propaganda for truth is the force of personal example. The great ones attract disciples, lesser figures whose mission it is to preach and to teach. These are the gospelers who, unequal to the highest task, spend their lives in converting others. The Mm. great ones are indifferent in the profoundest sense. They don't ask you to believe. They electrify you by their behavior. They are the awakeners. What you do with your petty life is of no concern to them. (laughs) What you do with your life is only of concern to you, they seem to say. In short, their only purpose here on earth is to inspire. Mm. And what more can one ask of a human being than that? Ooh, yeah. Um, so please follow me on Twitter. Yeah, follow Eddie Pepitone. I, I love you with all my heart. I Here's love you two too, last ones that I wrote down and we will say goodbye. The only thing we never get enough of is love. And the only thing we never give enough of is love. Mm. Here's the last one. Every moment is a golden one for him who has the vision to recognize it as such. Say that one again. Every moment is a golden one for him who has the vision to recognize it as such. Mm. Read Henry Miller. Go to eddiepepitone.com. Follow him on social media. Follow me on social media. And But, but, be still, everybody. Be still like the hummingbird. Be still like the hummingbird. Which is one of Henry Miller's books. Yes. And Thanks for having me, man. Uh, long live Henry Miller. Long live Henry Miller. Long may you run, Eddie Pepitone. Long may you run, Rhodes. Shalom, amigos. Love you, man. I love you too, my brother. <laughs> Let me go to the bathroom. Respect. Long may you run. Shalom, amigos. E, amigas. That was a fucking good episode. Wouldn't you agree? Tom Rhodes, you're a funny man. Tom Rhodes, you're an international comedian. Tom Rhodes, karate kick, baby, oh yeah. Tom Rhodes, you're a groovy dude. You go all around the world, telling jokes to all of the people. You are an international comedian. You're funny to everybody in every single country in the world. Tom Rhodes, I like you very much. I think you're talented and very wonderful. Tom Rhodes, you're the best guy in the world. I want to be your friend. You should call me sometime. Here is my phone number, 603-644-0048. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tom Rhodes. You're an international comedic sensation. Tom Rhodes. I like to listen to your podcast. Tom Rhodes. You're the best man to ever walk on the earth. 